there is great value for our society in the work done in the liberal arts and in the sciences. In this series, we will show that the commonly held belief of division between the two is inherently false. In this series, we will explore commonalities in knowledge that will allow us to invent our common future. We will, in fact, open source knowledge. The Cosby Show episode, Vanessa's Bad Grade, which originally aired on NBC on January 16, 1986, by and large was fairly representative of the series. It focused on ordinary problems set against the backdrop of the Huxtable family's beautiful upper middle class home. What will happen when Vanessa tells her parents that she received a D on a history exam? Will Denise forgive Vanessa for borrowing a sweater without permission? How will the Huxtables resolve these problems and in what ways does this family resemble our own? In the final scene of the episode, youngest sibling Rudy is up late watching television. As mother Claire is about to admonish her, she stops when she sees and hears what is on the set a broadcast of Martin Luther King delivering his famous address at the 1963 March on Washington. The entire family gathers in front of the television and reverently watches what is on the screen. The chatter of the Huxtable family has been silenced. The only sounds those of King delivering the speech that has functioned as a synecdoche, or a part representing the whole, for the civil rights struggles of the 1950s and 1960s. The scene not only functions as the show's commemoration of Martin Luther King's birthday, which would be celebrated four days after the broadcast, but is an instance in which the show makes visible what had been implied throughout the series. The Huxtables are the fulfillment of the dream King articulated that day in 1963. This episode also illustrates three primary ways we have defined the relationship between civil rights and television. First, it introduces to us that television has been an eyewitness to civil rights struggles. Not only did King's oratory find its way into living rooms across the country, but so too did images of college students beaten while peacefully trying to integrate lunch counters in North Carolina, or of police officers brutalizing and gassing marchers on their way from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama. Television newscasts publicized the cause of, and generated popular and political support for, Southern civil rights throughout what historians have labeled the classical civil rights era, the decade between the 1954 Brown v. Board of Education decision and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Second, we can think of television as an historian of the civil rights era. Both in documentary and fictional programming, television has narrated the history of civil rights, often drawing on the newscasts of the period as its archive. Television, as in this episode of The Cosby Show, has structured our popular memory of what was civil rights by recirculating and reasserting the importance of certain iconic figures and moments of the movement. Finally, we can view television as our societal mirror. The presence and position of African-American characters in television series has been designated as a site where dominant ideas about race and race relations in American culture are narrated. The Huxtables are a long way from Amos and Andy, characters that premiered on television in the early 1950s, or Fred Sanford, who first appeared in the 1970s, and, on the one hand, attest to the progress in race relations in the United States. On the other, in suggesting that America is indeed a colorblind society and that race is no longer a factor in an individual's access to the good life, the show both reinforces prevailing ideas of the Reagan era about the end of racism and erases and effaces the continuing struggles of African Americans by suggesting that racism is no longer a problem in American society. Today I want to discuss a fourth way to understand the relationship between civil rights and television television as a target of civil rights activism. Civil rights, both directly and implicitly, has been the subject of television broadcasts and television reform has been the object of civil rights struggles from the earliest days of television in the United States until our present moment. Over the course of television's history, for example, activists and audience members have monitored television programs for the depiction of African Americans. Since the late 1940s, the NAACP was in continuous contact with television networks and stations to object to what it saw as malicious or stereotypical depictions of African Americans. These efforts culminated in the association's boycott of the television series Amos and Andy and Beulah in the early 1950s, in which the NAACP built a coalition to protest against the stations airing the shows and to boycott the program's sponsors. For the following 60 years, this form of activism, in which viewers launch a boycott of a program to register their disapproval of its content, has persisted. 
drawing on the power of television viewers as consumers, not only of television, but of sponsors' products, the boycott has been a way for audiences to participate in the shaping of parameters of television's content, and in turn, in delimiting the proper contours of the nation's shared culture as delivered by the television screen. Activists have targeted not only the programming, but also the practices and policy structuring television in their broader struggles for civil rights. Two motivations have underlined these kinds of television reform campaigns. First, civil rights activists have understood that social change in an age of mass media by necessity involves the culture industries, the producers of media that provide us with texts, sites, and sounds that have structured how we understand our world and our place in it. Material changes in this view can only be accomplished if accompanied by forms of cultural expression that accommodate or are sympathetic to reformers' visions of a better society. In order to ensure that television better reflected the needs and interests of African Americans, civil rights activists have engaged in media reform campaigns to rally for policies that would enable more responsible representations. At the center of American broadcasting policy has been the licensing of a public resource, the airwaves, to private entities. In exchange for a broadcasting license, broadcasters have been required to serve the public interest, convenience, or necessity, and the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, an administrative agency that regulates broadcasting, has been charged with ensuring that broadcasters and the conditions of broadcasting in the United States meet public interest goals. However, who constitutes the public and what defines its interests have been contentious questions since Congress passed the Radio Act of 1927, which became the blueprint for the nation's broadcasting policy. Civil rights activists have lodged television reform campaigns to broaden the definition of the broadcasting public to include African Americans and to show the synergy between civil rights goals and the fulfillment of television's public interest requirement. License renewal applications and media ownership policies have been important stages where civil rights battles have been waged, and their history is central to our understanding of how television has functioned as a target for civil rights activism. The story of license renewal challenges as a civil rights activism begins in Jackson, Mississippi in 1964. That year, civil rights activists filed a petition to deny the license renewal of WLBT-TV, an NBC affiliate and one of two commercial stations in the city. Among the African-American community in Jackson, WLBT was notorious for its racist programming and for ignoring the needs and interests of African-Americans, who composed 45 percent of Jackson's population. Since the mid-1950s, citizens had filed complaints with the FCC over WLBT's broadcasts, yet the Commission continually renewed the license of the station in spite of mounting evidence that it was in violation of its public interest obligations. In its newscasts on integration, the station consistently only gave airtime to the segregationist perspective and denied civil rights leaders opportunities to respond. In this, the station was in violation of the Fairness Doctrine, a policy adopted by the FCC in 1949, which required broadcasters to dedicate time to controversial issues of import to their communities of service and to air both sides of the controversy. In addition, as Robert Britt Horowitz in his broadcast reform revisited, and Steve Clausen in Watching Jim Crow have documented, WLBT had a history of blacking out network programming that featured national civil rights leaders or that discussed civil rights activism in a manner sympathetic to the struggles of the activists. If you'd been watching, for example, the NBC program Home on WLBT in 1955, right before NAACP General Counsel and later Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall was to appear, you would have seen a disruption in the broadcast followed by a, sorry, cable trouble sign that disappeared after Marshall's segment had ended. As television networks increasingly focused on Southern civil rights, residents of Jackson would continue to see the sorry cable trouble signs throughout the following decade. Reverend Everett Parker, who was working in Jackson on behalf of the United Church of Christ, prepared to challenge the station's license renewal application and enlisted two local residents, Aaron Henry and Robert L. T. Smith, to be signatories on the petition. Like drives to register voters and direct action campaigns to desegregate public spaces, the petition was understood to be a challenge to the white power structure in Mississippi, its filing a potential impetus for violence against the civil rights workers. In an interview with Horowitz, Reverend Parker remembered that a lawyer for the NAACP had warned him and Henry not to file, arguing that if fixing their signatures on the document made them targets, was liable to get them killed, and was likely to do much good anyway.
The lawyer's skepticism about the efficacy of the petition was not only tied to the disparate power of white and black citizens in Jackson, but to the workings of television regulation in the mid-1960s. At that time, members of the broadcasting public were not granted standing, or a legal right to be heard, in the license renewal process. With respect to FCC decisions to grant or renew broadcasting licenses, the only individuals or parties granted standing were those who could show potential electrical interference or economic injury that may result from an FCC action. Under this definition, residents of Jackson did not have standing to petition against WLBT's license renewal, which the commission communicated to the petitioners after it granted the station a temporary one-year renewal. The petitioners appealed the decision, and in 1966, a U.S. Court of Appeals ruled against the FCC and extended standing to representative and responsible members of the broadcasting public. In other words, community members now have the right to level meaningful protests against broadcasting stations in the form of license renewal challenges. This case, Office of Communications of the United Church of Christ versus the FCC, was a watershed moment, not only for the residents of Jackson, but for public interest, civil rights, and community groups across the nation. The FCC held evidentiary hearings in Jackson after the 1966 court ruling, after which it renewed WLBT's license. The petitioners appealed again, and in 1969, the U.S. Court of Appeals overturned the FCC's decision. After years of comparative hearings, the FCC awarded the license to an African-American organization led by Aaron Henry. Concurrently, drawing on the expanded definition of standing, activists across the country, from feminists to conservatives, environmentalists, Mexican-Americans, Jewish groups, African-Americans, all filed or threatened to file petitions to deny against broadcasting stations who, in their eyes, had failed to meet their public interest obligations. Often the threat of a petition would result in an agreement between a station and the would-be petitioners in which the station would make concessions to improve its programming and policies and to broaden its understanding of who was the public in its community of service. In May 1972, for example, WNBC and WABC in New York signed an agreement with a coalition called Black Citizens for Media in which the stations promised to hire more African Americans at all levels of station operation, to program more black-oriented news and entertainment shows, and to consult with an African American advisory council at least four times a year. Three years later, in a rare instance when the FCC revoked broadcasting licenses because of content-based allegations, nine public television stations in Alabama lost their licenses for failing to include African Americans and African American concerns in their programming. According to the petition that ushered in the station's license revocations, African Americans appeared in only 5% of the station's programming, a figure which itself was owed to the station's carriage of the children's television program, Sesame Street. Challenging license renewals was a way for civil rights activists not only to challenge the programming practices of local stations, but also to insist that broadcasters and their federal regulators recognize African Americans as a meaningful part of the public broadcasters are obligated, on condition of their licenses, to serve. These television reform efforts also were opportunities for civil rights activists, as well as other citizens and public interest groups, to articulate the relationship between the discrimination they experienced and the images and stories circulating on their television sets. And despite their reassuring gestures of narratives like The Cosby Show, civil rights activists have continued to see racial discrimination at work in American society and have looked to media activism as a site to address it. Most recently, this effort for media equity has taken the form of struggles over media ownership policies. Since the early 1940s, the FCC has tied diversity in ownership to diversity in perspectives over the air, and as such, began mapping media ownership rules. By the late 1970s, the commission had placed limits on how many radio stations and television stations entities could own, prevented cross-ownership of broadcasting stations and newspapers in single markets, and adopted a number of policies to encourage female and minority ownership of broadcasting stations. These policies, like the FCC's ownership restrictions, intended to meet the public interest goal of diversity and were premised on the contention that a direct correlation exists between station ownership and station content, and on the notion that minority-owned stations would contribute perspectives and viewpoints currently absent in television's marketplace of ideas. The FCC's media ownership rules would change dramatically beginning in the 1980s. Mark Fowler, Ronald Reagan's appointed FCC chairperson, famously had referred to television as a toaster with pictures, 
And when he took the reins at the commission, he promised to treat broadcasters as marketplace competitors rather than fiduciaries of the public. In other words, Fowler believed that the workings of the market rather than federal regulations was the best means to serve the public, and thus he led the FCC during his tenure in removing or modifying many of the restrictions the commission had imposed on broadcasters, including loosening ownership caps with an eye toward eliminating them altogether. Federal courts in the 1990s, furthermore, rendered unconstitutional the policies that intended to expand minority ownership of broadcasting. In 1996, as part of the Telecommunications Act, Congress further revised broadcasting ownership rules. The result was a media landscape increasingly dominated by media conglomerates. Local communities have fewer locally owned broadcasting stations, and the number of stations owned by women and minorities diminished. When, in 2003, the FCC was poised to further loosen media ownership rules once again, civil rights activists, alongside other citizens' groups, protested loudly. The media ownership battles of 2003, what media scholar and activist Robert McChesney has labeled the uprising of 2003, engaged organizations and individuals across the political spectrum to fight against greater media consolidation. By the end of the uprising, around 2 million people had contacted the commission to express disapproval over looser ownership rules. The FCC adopted new ownership rules anyway, and a coalition of civil rights and public interest groups filed an appeal. In 2004, the petitioners won. The Third Circuit of Appeals ruled, by and large, against the FCC and remanded their new rules back to the commission. This case, Prometheus Radio Project versus the Federal Communications Commission, delivered a tangible victory to a burgeoning media reform movement and, importantly, raised the issue of minority ownership in broadcasting stations as an important public interest goal. The court admonished the commission for failing to consider how its new ownership policies would affect minority ownership of broadcasting stations and, consequently, emboldened civil rights activists to push for new policies to increase minority ownership. For the past five years, activists have petitioned the FCC to revise its ownership rules to enable more women and people of color to own broadcasting stations. At stake in these efforts are a number of interrelated concerns. In examining the number of and roles afforded to people of color on television, activists have found that dangerous stereotypes continue and argue that these representations play a role in maintaining racial discrimination. In addition, the paltry number of people of color who own broadcasting stations, people of color own 3.2% of broadcasting stations, raises questions for activists about the legacy of discriminatory regulations and policies on the ability of minorities to gain access to the airwaves. Thus, like the license renewal challenges of the 1960s and 70s, contemporary civil rights activists see both the content of television programming and the practice of broadcasting policy as important battlegrounds in the ongoing struggle for civil rights. And leveling this campaign to alter the FCC's media ownership rules, these activists both intend to reshape broadcasting policy and to document the intersections between media regulation, broadcasting content, and the fight for social justice. Cable television channels like Nickelodeon and TV Land continue to air episodes of The Cosby Show, alongside many other programs from television's past. These channels construct their own narrative of television history, juxtaposing the Huxtables with televisual families like the Jeffersons, the Cleavers, and the Clampets. As we watch it, it is tempting to read The Cosby Show in relation to these other programs, viewing it as a symbol of televisions and our success in overcoming the racial prejudices of our past. Yet we must take care to examine the historical and the ongoing struggles over television, in which what takes place both on and off screen has mattered profoundly to the fight for civil rights. Protestants and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last.